Violin World, written by Tsar Yoshi. Chapter 375 Starlight Flies East One day out of Riverfall, the noonday sun shone distantly from above on the deck of the Immortal Dream, a front of clouds billowing down from the mountains in the distance behind them. Maple stood on the deck, looking backwards, her loosely braided mane blowing in the wind. Thinking, her voice asked, and she turned to see Slipstream walking up beside her. The Pegasus still wore her sweater, and it looked quite cozy in the high mountain air. I did it again, didn't I? Maple sighed in resignation, shaking her head. Overreacted and made a huge decision the moment something happened to get me emotional. And all my friends were along with it yet again. I wonder if I'll ever learn. Slipstream tilted her head in concern. I suppose we could tell Shinesburg to turn back, if you've changed your mind about... I'm not even sure, Maple cut her off, still staring over the edge. For all I know, we'd wait several days and I'd still come to the same decision. My house isn't livable, so I'd have to stay somewhere else. I know Starlight doesn't like it in Riverfall. And my life has been such a series of ups and downs that I never had a normal to return to in the first place. And as much as I love Amber and Willow, she sighed again, I don't know what I need, but I have a chance to look for it instead of waiting in bed for it to drop into my lap. And I think we can do this. We're all more experienced than we were in Onridge. This time, we can make this trip worthwhile. Slipstream gave an uncertain grin. You might be a seasoned adventurer now, but I'm still just a nobody who jumped at the chance to be along for the rides. <laughs> Maple's eyes widened. I'm definitely not a seasoned... Uh, she paused, thinking, I almost am, aren't I? I've certainly survived a lot. To me, everyone is, Slipstream said, standing and looking back with her, leaving Maple staring at the back of the Pegasus's ears. I was born in a Stone District hospital back when the Stone District was for well-off vacation homes and growing cool weather terrace crops, raised in Iron Ridge by two married parents who were always home for dinner spent my time in school, got a job in Skyport Food Court, got promoted from there to the information kiosk, dreamed of being promoted again to a flight attendant, about as normal and uninteresting as you can get. My family never traveled, never got rocked with all that political drama while I was a kid, all that. Ponies like you who come out of a town that's basically been off the map for years? I'd know, because I was the pony others would ask about things like that, and no one asked. And you got... Then you get all involved with everything, and there's battles and revolutions, and suddenly half the economy vanishes overnight. She wiped her brow with a wing. Just saying, but all of you are something else. I feel like a third wheel. Hmm, that sounds like me ten years ago. I grew up raised by multiple families, with my biological mother barely a part of my life, and my father as an anonymous stallion in Sosa, but that's normal for Riverfall too. Me, Amber, and Willow, just free fillies with dreams of going on a big adventure to the city. Sounds exotic to me. Slipstream folded her forelegs on the railing, looking impressed. And again, I just got a little overdosed on how exotic and exciting different places can be. I'm going to need to keep my head on tighter for traveling like this, huh? Maple blinked, slowly realizing that... She was the veteran another pony was coming to for advice. Whether she felt like she deserved it or had just ran around flailing was another matter, but acting sensibly is good, she murmured, feeling slightly out of place saying it. <laughs> Slipstream strings fluttered, holes knitted in her sweater so she could still use them while staying warm. I just hope I can make myself useful now that I'm traveling with Iron Ranger's finest. Maple nodded. She didn't say it, but she felt exactly the same. Looks like we're outrunning the weather, Slipstream remarked, trying to keep the conversation going. A lot of the flights in Iron Ridge get cancelled due to bad weather around the skyport, and sometimes flights get delayed coming in from Yakankistan, but I never see too much of that from the north or east. The Griffin Empire's climate in particular is supposedly very mild. I've heard some locals say their goddess Garshiva controls the weather, but I don't know if it's true. I suppose you could ask Gerardo, Maple said absently. Leaving behind Iron Ridge and Riverfall meant leaving behind the constant rain. Oh, she wouldn't miss getting drenched, but the sound of it on a roof at night had always been soothing. Hopefully, the east wasn't a total desert. 
I should, shouldn't I? Slipstream perked up. Good idea. Want to come? I think I'm going to go check on Starlight, Maple apologized with a smile, stretching her back and turning in a circle. I hope she's found something to do. I was out here watching the world and thinking, but I think she thinks far too much. Slipstream shrugged. Okay, I'll be on the bridge or wherever Gerardo and the others are. After a full circuit of the ship, in which she found Valet fast asleep in a library chair, and a Do Not Disturb sign hung over the door to someone's cabin room, Maple found Starlight in the observation room at the very front of the ship, hunched over a book. The filly's ears flicked when she approached, and she realized uh, there was no point in being stealthy. Hello, Starlight, Maple said, settling down next to her in front of the panoramic protruding glass window that let a viewer see in every direction, including down. Keeping busy? Crying, Starlight grunted, flipping a page and not looking up. All I've done for the last ever is sleep and try to stay alive, and I stopped doing things for fun for a while before that. This feels weird. Maple smiled sadly. Are you succeeding? Am I interrupting anything? I don't know. I'm passing time. Starlight kept her focus on the book, tail flicking once. I need to learn to enjoy myself when nothing bad is happening, though, so that's what I'm trying to do. Well then, Maple whispered, folding her legs beneath her and laying next to Starlight, draping the filly with her tail. I suppose I'll pass time with you. Her four hooves rested on glass, and the view straight down showed the Yule, still tracking eastward and sticking within several miles of the mountain wall. The terrain hadn't changed at all from the area around Riverfall, with stretches of massive old-growth forest, hills covered in shorter conifers, and impassably rough rocky cracks covered in jungle foliage so green it left her seeing a red afterimage when she blinked and looked away. Most of it was moss, vines, and ferns, plants that thrived in the cool and wet, and every few miles the river grew from another tributary from the mountains to the south. Already, the Yule seemed slightly thicker than she remembered it, though the still-draining flood was partly to blame. She could see flood damage higher on the banks where two thin lines of grey had been scoured away, and wondered if there had once been fallen tree trunks and the like that had been swept away by the surge. Her head rotated, and she looked at the rock wall to the south. Shinespark's cruising altitude was more than twice the height of the tallest trees, yet as far away as they were, she still had to shift and crane her neck to see the top. The perfectly vertical face was frequently marked by columns of white spray, water making a journey so far down that even the clouds couldn't carry it back up. Where did the mountain storm water even come from? Some of the ribbons vanished halfway down, their sources too insubstantial for their mist to survive dilution by the massive fall, and others started far below the top, jetting from caves or underground rivers where water had been trapped by the valleys and unable to find a surface way out. Maple shifted again, looking to the north. Where there wasn't mountain, the horizon went on as far as her eyes could see, and she quickly realized the Yule had tributaries from that direction as well. It only made sense, since the massive rainstorms had to dump their water somewhere. Between the shattered rock and vertical jungle, she could make out dozens of northern lakes that dotted the landscape and fed into the river to drain. Fish were an exportable resource, right? Someone could probably found a community between several of the richest lakes and see it grow quite successful. And in front of him, the Yule continued. Maple closed her eyes. They wouldn't be reaching the Griffin Empire anytime soon. Maple? She woke from a nap to a little hoof poking her in the side and stole his face right down in front of her own. I'm getting hungry, the filly announced, and it'll be evening soon. Do you want to make dinner? Oh, I could do that, Maple replied, blinking herself away and stretching her legs. It was probably a good idea. She couldn't actually remember if she had gotten to make anyone dinner in quite a while. She let herself yawn, left Starlight to her own devices, and trotted for the galley. Shinespark's supply room, seen properly lit and wide awake, was a thing of beauty. Maple stood in the center, surrounded by crates higher than she was, allowing her mouth free rein to water as she daydreamed what she was about to make. 
raw ingredients, there were plenty of sacks of essentials like flour, and a cooler for milk and eggs and the like set against a wall that was undoubtedly connected to the air conditioning apparatus in the cargo bay, which was the next room over. The ship's array of spices was also impressive. A lot of those were likely imported. She would need to play with them for sure. Something spicy then, a maple's eye scanned a large rack of fruit, fresh and dried. Uh, maybe not, her diet was still recovering from eating nothing but an iron rich. Something spicy then, uh, maple's eye scanned a large rack of fruit, fresh and dried. Uh, maybe not, her diet was still recovering from eating nothing but an iron rich. The valet would appreciate some as a side dish. Beginning to hum unconsciously, Maple danced around the room, taking stock of everything else they had. Hanging from the rafters were strings of tubular things she was reasonably sure were meat, though while she recalled a discussion on the subject during the breakfast she had shared on the ship in Anridge, she couldn't remember if it was a delicacy or an oddity. Either way, better to ask about that first to be safe, and eh, she didn't know how to use it in addition in the first place. Vegetables, there were plenty of vegetables as well, barley too. Maple licked her lips, the first day they hit cold weather, that was going in soup. Split peas, beans, various legumes, she checked one of the giant crates being rewarded with squash and gourds. Those could go well spiced. She closed her eyes and sniffed a tomato, an idea beginning to take form in her mind. What else could she find? Bags of sugar and salt, good to know where those were. Unground black peppercorns, she'd need a grinder or maybe a dish they could work whole with. The next raid had ears of corn, that would be a treat to prepare. They had butter, right? Yes, they did, along with cream. Cream! Furtively, Maple got out the tiniest glass she could find and took a sip, just for fun, shivering at the richness. While she was trying things... All the caps came off the spice jars, and her nose passed over them, inspecting carefully. Plenty, she knew instinctively, since everybody got Riverfall's food supply from Anridge. Plenty more were new and unique, likely fancy or high-end ones Shinesburg had gotten her hooves on. She'd used those in moderation until she knew what they did. Checking more, one jar sent Maple reeling back with a wall of nostalgia. She hadn't smelled that since the boat stopped. It was one of those feelings that had vanished from her life with a subtlety she never knew it was gone, and her eyes almost started to water as the sweet aroma reawakened memories of full hood dishes. She couldn't remember her name, but one of the mares in the pool that raised her had always cooked with this. It had to be used. Maple replaced the cap and pocketed the jar with a cutie mark. It had more or less recovered from the damage it took in the flame district, and she was feeling empty without using it to carry anything around. Face set in eager purposeful determination, Maple reached for a suitable pot, changed her mind and grabbed one a size larger, and marched into the kitchen, preparing to cook. End of chapter 375